ships that stretch across the water, one connected to the other, listing gently towards the shore. It looks like a decaying ghost fleet with their crews mysteriously missing. There's something really quite spooky about it. They're covered in barnacles and moss and seaweed. It's almost as if nature is claiming them back again. Heavy rusted chains extend across their decks. Their crews long since vanished, but still they hinted secrets yet to be revealed. People think there's still treasure somewhere deep inside, and if they can just get in there and see what's there, maybe they'll find something really interesting. It's hard to tell how old these ships are or where they're from, but there's one thing they all have in common. The really unusual thing about these boats is that, unlike most, they're not made of steel. These ones are made of concrete. They've definitely inspired a sense of mystery growing up. You start to wonder, like, what are these things? Where did they come from? What is their story? And how are they connected to one of the deadliest weapons ever? The answer lies in the desperate days towards the end of the First World War. The U.S. Navy urgently needed to expand its fleet, but was running out of raw materials and had to find another solution. They come up with the idea, let's try concrete. Well, problem with most concretes is they're too heavy. Now, they had to develop, and they succeeded in developing a new type of concrete that was light, but still very, very strong. During World War I, they were a go-to option because they didn't take up the important raw materials like steel that were needed for the war effort, and they could be made cheaply and much more functionally out of concrete. And concrete, of course, does float. These ships so impressed the US government that they ordered 24 of them. And they're completed just as the war ends. But they're put into service, and they actually work pretty well. Once you've made a concrete ship, it is actually uh, quite a long-lasting thing. Concrete, unlike steel, doesn't get metal fatigue, doesn't wear out, it doesn't rust. So potentially, you have a very easy-to-maintain kind of ship. In fact, these ships were so effective that when there was a shortage of steel during the Second World War, naval architects once again turned to concrete. All of them had a very similar purpose, which was mainly to act as freight ships and for storage, because they're very good at holding large amounts of material and keeping it dry. But what are 10 cargo ships from two world wars doing here in British Columbia? This ghostly fleet that the locals call the Hulks. Around the beginning of the last century, paper mills sprung up all along the coast, including here at Powell River. The logs used to make the paper were transported to the mill by water and then unloaded into a log pond. It had to be big enough to store the logs and be protected from the elements to keep it safe for the workers. The only problem here is it's exposed to severe winds from both the north and the south, and they needed to find a way to shelter the log pond. So the mill owners decided to build a breakwater, a barrier built into the sea to protect the log pond from the force of the waves. As mechanical engineer Matthew Denniston explains. So typically a breakwater structure would be made of large rocks dumped in big piles and it would build up from the sea floor to make that protection. Where in our case, it's far too deep to make this type of breakwater. So I think the light bulb just came on. Hey, why not use ships instead? 
steel being in salt water in the ocean deteriorates very quickly if it's not protected. And we found that we would have a steel ship that would come in and it would maybe last 20 years before it had to be decommissioned, where these concrete ships were already 40 years old, coming in to replace them and have still lasted another 50 plus years. In 1948, the first concrete ships arrived in Powell River. But how effective would they be at protecting from the elements? The ships were anchored down and chained together to form a sort of artificial reef. To help them withstand the elements, they were weighed down with gravel and they list to one side so their decks are angled towards the shore. They're actually much heavier than ordinary ships, so much more effective in keeping the water and the weather at bay. So one of the most unique things about this ship is that it was actually a part of some of the first nuclear testing that the US military did on Bikini Atoll. And this ship specifically was part of the nuclear test Baker. The bomb propelled a dome of water about a mile wide into the sky. It created a wall of radioactive mist that contaminated many of the surrounding ships, including the quartz. They were simply there to see the effect of the nuclear blast on ships. <laughs> so, you know, they had ships of every type and description at Bikini Atoll, and they wanted to get radioactivity readings. They also wanted to see the blast effect uh, that different nuclear weapons would have at different ranges. Ten years later, and radiation free, she arrived at Powell River to join the other concrete ships. The service life was supposed to only be 15 years, when in reality, here we are 75 years later, and they are still holding strong. So why are there now plans to sink some of them? Today, the paper mill no longer needs such a large log pond. The plans now are to sink some or most of the ships and allow them to become a natural reef, bringing to life again the underwater maritime colony and community. The ships are an extraordinary story of creation and technology. They were born out of desperation, out of a need to find a way to build ships with new materials. And yet when that need was gone, they found another use here, acting as a breakwater. And when even that role is completing, they're now gonna find another one down on the seabed as reefs. They really are a testimony to the creativity and creation of what can be done with new materials.